We live. Craig Jones, my brother, how are you, man? Yeah, yeah, good, good, how are you? Everything good, thanks for doing this in such short notice, man, I appreciate it. Oh, no worries. Thanks for having me on. How's everything going? Do you, do you live in New York or you're still in Australia and, 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 and back and forth? How, how does that work? Uh, I made the move to New York full time probably in March. Okay. But I was I spent probably six months here last year preparing for ADCC. So, I mean, I made the move. Uh, I'm waiting for my visa. But uh, it's probably a good time to be stuck waiting for a visa because no one can travel anyway, right? Exactly. And, and I was just going to say that. Like, you, you made a move in March, like pandemic blew up like just after that right yeah yeah very strange time to move to new york right? <laughs> yeah, everybody moving away how how were you handling all of this the well training impacted to to some level right like you you guys have uh a couple of uh good partners you you train all the you, you don't have those giant uh Danaher classes in the morning but you, you still get some quality training, right? Like, you, you train with Gordon, and the, those guys come over. You ho we'll, we'll, we'll get some, like, like, private sessions there. How much that impacts uh, your your regular training? I think it's – to be honest, I think it's probably better, better than usual because, like, uh, usually I would take – maybe we do six rounds. I would have uh, one or two hard rounds. But right now, it's basically – every round is pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. There's – without the regular class – uh, there's not too many rest rounds anymore. Yeah, so yeah. for me, I probably prefer it as well because Henzo's obviously is so popular. There's too many people in the room sometimes. So you really, you can't wrestle, you can't do a certain number of uh, things. So, I mean, especially when I'm training with a guy like Nicky Rod, where we could end up, <laughs> we could end up flying Fly all, all the over the <laughs> Yeah, it's probably better right now, to be honest. Yeah, that makes sense. Those, those seven o'clock classes are packed, right? Like it's, it's crazy. It's yeah, crazy. yeah, especially, especially. I think Monday is like the busiest one. Everyone travels to New York to do the double nogi yes. morning and lunch. Oh, that's right. I thought it was the Tuesday class because I think the Tuesday class is the one that uh, George used to fly over to to uh, to to attend. I'm not now. I'm not sure if it's Tuesday or if it was Monday. Yeah, true. I can't even remember anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, let's get that uh, last week uh, out of the way. The submission underground. What happened there, man? Like everybody's talking about. I was watching, and everybody's like, "Oh my god, this is so." Just, just kind of like describe it to us a little bit. What, what, what everybody saw it, but just like from your perspective. Yeah. So, uh, so I was, I was making some noises from the uh, body triangle. I was, uh -huh. I was like. Like when someone squeezes you and you're trying to move, you can't, you sort of can't help sometimes but make some noise. I think what made it sound particularly bad was the fact that there was no crowd. It was complete silence. Hmm. So the referee was seeing Mason with his arms around my head and he was assuming that I was in a neck crank. But it was, it was to be honest, it was mainly just the squeeze of the body. My neck felt pretty safe. So him hearing that and then Mason, what Mason did – uh, he, he obviously comes from an IBJJF background, so any vocalization is going to be considered a, a submission. So um, obviously ADCC and EBI is where I come from, where unless you say tap, no no noises are going to be considered a submission. So as soon as I started grunting, Mason started screaming at the referee that I was verbal tapping. And the right. first time I grunted, the referee let it go. So he, And then Mason retook the same grip squeezed the exact same way and on the second time i grunted the referee called it so i think mason sort of um he encouraged the referee day, to take yeah yeah so i mean it was it was a strange situation like the referee jumped in thinking i was in danger so i mean we cleared it up so we're gonna when we do a rematch basically you have to say tap and I mean, like a grunt, like people grunt all the time in roles. Like I could imagine if I was screaming, <laughs> the referee would stop. <laughs> stop <up. laughs> but yeah, just the grunt. I don't know. It was, a, it was just a confusing set of circumstances, sort of a bit of a letdown. Letdown for Mason as well as me, because obviously a lot of people online sort of taken away the victory from him. So it feels incomplete. Yeah. And and I, I, I'm just surprised by there's there's this. It, it, it's a little of a, like a nonsense uh, call because like 
it, it, it's clear you didn't tap. I, I have no idea why this guy could not say, oh, all right, let's let's keep going then. Or if he doesn't believe it, just go check a little like a, a like a like a quick replay or something like that and, and, and watch they, they we don't use technology as, as as much as we should for that kind of stuff. You know, I, w- I was just talking uh, about the UFC fights and 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 how we've been getting so many fights and, and there's some nights you see three, four like terrible decisions being called. And and, and I, I think I had a um, big nog uh, Minotauro Minotauro on, on the on the podcast and he's like a sort of a, like an ambassador uh, in Brazil for the for the UFC. And we were talking about bad calls and bad refs. Say, look, these guys should be removed from the arena. Not not for your case, but I'll get there. Say, removed from the arena, like soundproof cabins and, and full technology there. Like, they, they can rewind and, and, and replay and see what happens. They did that punch connect and stuff like that. And and, and come up with, with, with better decisions. And in, in the jiu-jitsu case, they should do the same. Right, if it's questionable, nothing stops the guy. Say, hey guys, all right, like, give me, give me a second. It goes there, check. It's like, no, he didn't tap, or no, he, he wasn't in, or, or whatever happened. And it's so easy. It's, it's just as easy as stepping out, watching a phone or iPad or something, and come back and just remake the decision. But they have that thing in mind, right? It's like once it's called, it's called. There's no coming back, and 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 it just puts like a like a like a crazy victory run in jeopardy for for something as silly as a eh. <laughs> yeah i mean I, they do it in uh freestyle wrestling right you can have a you can cool them out and they'll do a video review so it's like they can do it in other grappling sports i mean i, I don't see why not i mean especially with an ebi overtime like basically if i didn't submit he still gets the start on my back if we go again yeah you know it's like he's not losing any position or anything EBI is probably the easiest one to uh-huh. restart. Yes, that's that's true. That's true. How do you see the? You're a guy that was. That was I I remember Eddie Bravo talking about you and Gordon. And you guys were like uh, uh, coming up like prospects, right? Just just a few years back. How crazy that turn became, and 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 you guys are probably like I I, I keep saying like all the time like out of the top 20 probably we have like 10 of those just training here at Hansos. and how do you, did you see this this wave like of a like a, a jiu-jitsu and uh and super fights and stuff like that like it, I, I i talk to guys from mma all the time i said dude in your time you had to go fight mma because there was no money in jiu-jitsu it's like yeah i said look at it now it's like oh shit no shit like uh, guys don't need to do that turn anymore and I read that you you tried to uh, you wanted to be like a UFC fighter at some point, right? And and that's how you start training, and and that's totally out of your head now. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. When I started training, I was just watching the UFC at the time, but like it was so long ago that uh, the UFC or well, MMA itself is still illegal in Australia. So I was just like, wow. uh, I was just like, well, I'll just dedicate myself to jujitsu. And then by the time MMA was legalized, I was sort of hooked on jiu-jitsu but yeah it's funny you say that like most um you had a choice basically if you wanted to make money in jiu-jitsu for a time period it was like open an academy and then that's going to be detrimental yep. to your competition career yep. or go into mma yeah and then it sort of came out of nowhere metamora started but I really believe the guy that really kicked it all off is probably Eddie Bravo. For Eddie sure, Bravo I, an EBI I, I said with that his connection Ed, to Joe Rogan. Exactly, I said that too, Eddie Bravo. I say, look, you, you guy, you are probably like the, the guy. There, there were some before, but I think what Eddie Bravo got was the consistency, and 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 kind of like it, and not developing, but uh, showing talent, right? Like like you and Gordon will come, and everybody's like, who the fuck is this guy? He's fucking getting everyone you know and 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 that got that thing that ball rolling we have so many good uh uh tournaments now i i had a hollies here we're talking about kasai and ebi i think eddie is going a different way now with the combat jiu-jitsu is that something you ever consider uh i thought about it but it's just like uh 
it's not lucrative enough or not popular enough that I would want to change the way I train. That makes sense. I think potentially I could go in there without preparing for the slaps and still do pretty well because it seems like a lot of guys that do win the combat are just jiu-jitsu guys and they don't even throw a strike. Uh -huh. But then on the other end, you got a guy like Wagner Hosher who finished Nathan Orchard with slaps from the mount. So yep. there's always the exception to the rule. Or the fight that I always talked about that never happened, Verdun versus Gordon. I was like, that, 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 that's fucking. It's gonna be like one chance to each guy. Gordon's gonna get Verdun's leg, or Verdun is gonna slap Gordon, and whoever get it first is gonna win the fight. That, that was a crazy match. <laughs> that yeah, that would have been really exciting, right? But uh, what what happened with that Verdun? And then Gordon injured himself or something. You, like, you, I could still do it one day. It, it's cu it's cutting off. What was that? What would happen? What? Oh, I said. Uh, do, do you remember? Was it was it Gordon got injured? Is that I, why that? I, I, someone got, got injured. I don't think. I think. I think it was Gordon. I think it was Gordon got injured for the fight. I, I I could be wrong. It could be Verdun, but one of those two got got injured for the fight. I was so I was looking, and Gordon was doing was training some striking and stuff like that at the time. And he, he used to talk a lot about going to MMA. I think that, that's gone too. Uh, I had uh, Bushesha on a podcast, and, and he wants to go to MMA. He wants to do the, the MMA transition because he can see a, a potential uh, pay increase or something like that. Rodolfo Vieira recently, um, not recently, probably like a couple of years now, but he, he also said, hey, uh, I, I, I want different challenges and stuff like that. But it's just like you said, man. There's so much going on right now. You you can you can make a great living competing jujitsu, not not getting punched in the face. It's, it's it's it sounds a lot better, right? Yeah, I think like uh, what that last generation of guys missed out on in terms of the financial aspect was the instructional sales. One hundred percent. Like uh, you could release an instructional product now that would be worth maybe like three or four UFC fights. Yeah. Like if you pop. If you're very popular, uh, which a lot of these guys already are, uh, so obviously getting good MMA contracts initially. Some because the legends I watched watched coming up just missed the boat on the instructional sales. You know what I mean? There was so much money to be made, and I feel like lucky that my I timed it right. Luckily for my age, it was like it was a perfect timing of super fights and instructional products that offered a career that people didn't even know existed a few years back. That's right, and plus you develop your own fan base, and 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 that's your kind of your public for the for those instructionals, right? That uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be a hundred percent of everyone that likes jujitsu. I think I think that doesn't doesn't sync with these guys yet. They're like, well, how many of those I think I'm gonna sell? Say, so, well, if you have a good fan base, if, if you sell like I don't know five thousand <laughs> at a hundred bucks each, just just think small, right? And those guys like. I'm not gonna sell a million of those. I say, well, maybe you sell five thousand, maybe you sell two thousand at a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks, or, or or whatever. Gordon makes a killing of it. You have one at uh, BJJ Fanatics, right? Yeah, I got a few. I just haven't released any for a while yet. I think like I released my first instructional, and I got too caught up in trying to bring out other ones, so I, I've left it a bit of a gap. Mm. But like for so these people, uh, like if you think if you if you have a two hundred dollar DVD. And you sell only five thousand copies. That's already a million dollars. No shit. That's what, that's what I'm saying, right? It's it's so they, crazy yeah, money. It's 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 ridiculous. And the jujitsu fan base, especially in America, it's so it's so uh, it's so cult like. People want to collect things. They want to collect all your DVDs and stuff. They yeah. want to be part of the community. So it's very yeah, very lucrative. Exactly. I see ads for your instruction are popping up in every. I think like if you go to a bjj heroes or something like that i said do you want to learn from and it makes you feel bad actually it's like do you want to learn from craig jones and then there's like <laughs> yes or no and then it's just a a, a pop-up window right and then i go like oh shit i gotta click no because that's not what i'm here for now right so i click no and say are you sure you don't want to learn from craig jones i was like all right i'll learn from craig jones <laughs> Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's Bernardo Feria, yeah, marketing yeah. genius at play. <laughs> Bernardo's as dedicated to uh, internet marketing as he was to jujitsu back in the day, I that's believe. Right. Yeah, he, he made he made this whole uh, his Instagram account. It's an awesome one to follow because uh, he puts little uh, 
little movements every day. I was talking to a friend of mine, and he was complaining. He was like, well, I don't have time, and, and uh, you know, to sit down and do a full instructional. I don't have a part. I said, dude, just, just, just. and then I showed him Bernardo's Faria Instagram and say, look, he shows a move every day. There's, there's, maybe there's, like, even more than one move. That's all he posts. That's all he posts. It's like, and it's like a minute, two minute videos. You can sit down and just watch, and 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 that's it. I put some uh, mats on my garage. I put a TV right next to it, and uh, we do some uh, Hanzo Gracie online academy stuff. And 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 I, I have like a like a sixty pound dummy, and and that's kind of how we got our workout on. I was waiting because Hobson. Uh, had something going with his knee and, and he didn't want to push it but now he's good so now I'm going back to the city and training that, that's how we, we actually met I was there doing a, a, a session with uh, with Hobson uh, Hens's brother oh, very, yeah very cool um, Hobson's fights for Bellator right yes they're still waiting on a date uh, they're still waiting on a date he's, he's thinking September maybe October uh, I do the podcast with Kiwan too I don't know if you met Kiwan Q and Gracie. Yeah, yeah. I met him in London. Oh yeah, yeah that's Hodges where he lives. Uh, he lives with with uh, not with Roger, but uh, he 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 trains at uh, Roger Gracie Academy there. Yeah, I went in. I went in one day. Actually, I I met Braulio Estima. Well, I've met him before, but I got to know him when we did a training camp in Puerto Rico. And I was heading to London after for a match, and I was like, "Yo, Braulio, what do I got to do to roll with Roger Gracie?" Ooh. And he set it up, so I got to train with Roger for. I think we did two or three rounds, and yeah, Kiwan was there as well, so we're training with both of them. That's it was awesome. pretty cool because I was like, uh, Roger's sort of um, he it feels like he's it's hard to get training rounds in with him, you know what I mean? He's like all the way in London, yep. a lot of people dream of training with him and stuff, so it felt it was very cool to finally get to uh, get to train with the legend himself. It's it's amazing, right? And and and, and how was it just? <laughs> Because yeah, I, I did, I did a, I, I did. Listen, I, I'm a blue belt, but I had this thing. Uh, I, I was going to California, and I said I want to do a private with Hickson, and I was texting and trying to get a hold of someone, and, and then I had to call Hanzo. I say, Hanzo, you got, you gotta hook me up here. Can, can you contact and, and make the connection so I can, I can go and do a private with Hickson? He was like, Yeah, I'll make that happen, my brother. Go. So I was in California. I was gonna stay there for like ten days. That that was like day four, and I have no word. I was like, oh, "Fuck, it's not gonna happen, right?" And then one day I got a text message to say, "Hey, this is Hickson." I was like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> <laughs> so then I, I go and I and I had like a full flashback doing that that whole session with him. He was he was amazing, and, and he was all. I, I had no idea what Hanzo told him. So Hanzo is a little crazy. So he probably say. This is one of my students here. He trains here at the academy. Yeah, and then he trains here at the academy translates to you, Gordon Ryan, John Danaher. So Hickson's probably like, what the fuck this guy wants to do with me? <laughs> and, 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 and he's like, so are you training for competition? I was like, no, 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 no. So I don't know what Hanzo told you, but I'm a blue belt. I want to do like basic jiu-jitsu with you guys because that I think that's what you guys are the best on. Like the, You have like, I don't know, 20 moves that you master that and that's all it's, it's kind of like Hodger uh jiu-jitsu right it's, everybody says it's, it's, it's a very basic but super efficient and and i, and I told him say i want to learn basics so oh oh okay you will be my pleasure brother to show you invisible jiu-jitsu and i had a fit i was like oh this is gonna be fucking awesome <laughs> so i did it it was like a three hour thing we did 40 minutes on breathing and 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 just go like from base and mount and 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 sweeps. It was it was amazing. It it was just amazing. That's kind of what I was like. So how was it? Because you you all you it feels like you had that thing like, how do I get a roll with Roger? Right? It's like it's 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 fucking Roger Gracie, right? So how how was that for you? Like, yeah, it's funny. Some of these some of these guys that are so like you need a connection to get in there, right? Like you need someone to open the door because like, I mean, even for me, like on Instagram, I barely check my message requests and stuff like that. Like yeah. it's like, but if a friend messages me to set something up, it's like a, a foot in the door, really. It, you make it happen. Exactly. But yeah, Roland, Roland with Hodger was cool. I went into his academy for an open mat and there was like a room of like 40 people in geese training. 
and I was the only guy in Ugi. So I'm waiting for a chat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for him to come in, and then eventually he comes. Uh, and I remember thinking, I didn't know what to expect because he's he almost seems very very serious. Uh huh. Very Too serious, serious right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, but uh, he was pretty. He was pretty cool. I, I broke the ice by talking about his uh, win over Bouchesha at his retirement, and then he was uh, he was he was. Uh, he was much more relaxed and stuff, yeah. But we, <laughs> but we, we rode and he, he beat the shit out of me, so it was, it was pretty cool. I was like, I was like, all right, he still got it. <laughs> <laughs> you guys did a no gi or gi? No gi, right? No gi, yeah. Before we slapped hands, he looked at me. I didn't even know if he knew who I was or anything. He looked at me. He goes, "Oh, okay, leg lock master." <laughs> oh, he knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then we rode. He's, he's. Uh, I, it was cool to feel what he does so well. He's like his defense is ridiculous, but he's uh, his patience. And yeah, it's funny you mentioned the breathing exercises with Hickson. Like while I was rolling with uh, Hodger, he was doing a lot of sh a lot of breathing things. Like he was, uh, I can't even describe it, but I definitely could tell he was he was doing something with his breath work to control mm. his energy. Yeah, it's crazy. Hickson described that in a crazy way. He said uh, he would drop his his uh, heartbeat. I don't know. I'm I'm probably gonna say some cheating number here but I, I, I just to, so I can use it as, as an example so he would, he would drop his heartbeat to like 60 right or maybe 50 or whatever low heartbeat is and just before the fight he said like on the dressing room that was all I would concentrate he was dropping my heartbeat so I would walk into the ring with my heartbeat really low so let's say he was 50 say I, I get in there I'm at 50 my opponent it's already at 80 because he's excited, he's warming up, and he's jumping around, and, and and then the fight starts. So now, my heartbeat goes to 60, and my opponent, it's almost at 100. So, because we already trading punches, and I, I'm, I'm still thinking on my, on my, on, on controlling my cardio. So, now my heartbeat, it's at 80, and my opponent, it's like 120. And he's already breathing hard, and, and now I just got to wait. And, and and they all have that and and it's it, it's crazy and he, he said to me if you get tired no matter how good you are it's like you're tired you're done so they yeah. they, they they have this uh this this mentality i'm, I'm not sure all of them but the hodger definitely does it was funny you said the the Bushesha fight because i did a podcast with hodger and uh we did a breakdown of his uh Bushesha fight and it was epic he was i put it on the screen and on the when I did the editing, I, I did like a like a picture in picture window here, and and he, and you can watch him explaining what he was doing, and he was doing just that. He was waiting for Bushesha to get tired. <laughs> yeah. What What did I say to him? I said uh, I asked him about the Bushesha match, and I said what I liked most was that you had signed up to do an IBJJF Grand Prix, and you had the super fight. But the second you won the super fight, you retired from the sport. So you didn't give him a chance for a rematch. <laughs> Bushesha kind of said that. I did, I, I did a podcast with Bushesha. He was kind of bummed by that. He's like, well, you know, you can force the guy to fight, but we, yeah, we, we were supposed to have a rematch. <laughs> yeah, like I thought if Hodger had lost the super fight, he would have done the Grand Prix and had another shot at him. So I was like, he put, Hodger played it pretty well. He left it open, so he had two chances, but Bushesha only had one. Yeah, I, I, I praised him for, for taking the super fight because uh, the talk was that he was going to be his last fight. But he had he had the, the, the he had signed up already for the for the for the other tournament. But the, 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 the talk was like that that's going to be his last fight. And I was like, that's a fucking dangerous way to 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 try to retire. Right. It's like you, you get one of the top guys in the planet. The guy that almost beat you, and they say, "Well, that's why I chose him because we did that one fight. It was a draw, but everybody, when they talk about the first fight, they remember the armbar, and and, yeah, and they were like, right. oh, if there's an extra minute there, he will have Roger, and and say that's all people talk about it.' So I I wanted to be him. It it would have been cool if he did the Grand Prix, like we we would have seen him versus Leandro Low. I think yes. that was lined up. That so, would have been crazy to see. Leandro Lowe, that's what really got a bunch of eyes on you, right? Like on the 2017 ADCC when when you submit him? Yeah, that was that, that was the one. They gave me 
Leandro first round because I was a Asian trials winner and they sort of seed it and Asian trials winners are considered the uh, the lowest rank of all the trials. So Good luck set, with that, right? <laughs> yeah. I think they, they set me up with one of the top seeds because Leandro was considered um, – Leandro had done that super fight with Gordon and he won, but it was sort of controversial because they weren't – they didn't give away any stalling penalties, really. Like, had it been ADCC, a real ADCC match, he would have been disqualified. So I think Leandro won because he shot two double leg takedowns. Mm. So everyone, basically, I mean, the details, the details are important, but most people just remember Leandro beat Gordon. So I had Leandro first round. So yeah, it was pretty. It was a pretty tough setup. I really didn't know what to expect going into the match, but I reassured myself because I was like, Leandro's world class but he's not really a strong finisher. He doesn't finish a lot of opponents. So that gave me confidence because I was like, all right, so we've got a no points period where I can really go really chase after Leandro. And I was not, I was really basically expecting him not to turn it up to the points period. So it left me room to sort of, uh, to sort of breathe in that match. And if it takes you down, it takes you down. It doesn't count. Right. And then you can, you can, you can still work. Right. That that's, that's genius uh, thinking there. Yeah, well, I had to tell myself something to uh, be to reassure myself against one of the legends. <laughs> you got to find one way to uh, to paint a positive picture. When when did you uh, decide to make the move? When did you land the Hanzos? How how did a uh, Gordon uh, relationship started? That that kind of stuff. How how did you make your way here? Well, the first, it was actually uh, so I had that epic match with Gordon at the EBI the one with the armbar, right? So yep. um, we had that match. And then the next week, we both were competing on Kasai. And what was funny was Kasai grappling had like four different locker rooms. So they put me me in the locker room full of Henzo Gracie. So, <laughs> so I, I, I walk in the next uh, week at the event and I look, ar I look around in the locker room and I'm just like John Danaher, it's like Gordon, it's like Tom DeBlas. I was like, They really just put me in the Henzo Gracie locker room. <laughs> But over the course of the night, we're all pretty friendly, joking around. I think Danaher, because he's from New Zealand, he mm. really enjoys uh, speaking to people from that part of the world. So we got along pretty well, and those guys had to come train next week. And then from that point on, whenever I was in the States or wherever I was in the East Coast, I would start training more regularly with the guys. And it, yeah, it just worked out. worked out pretty well. But I didn't make the permanent move until march this year mm -hmm. it's it, it's funny how jiu-jitsu has this uh friendship kind of thing right because <clears throat> it's not something you see on mma or something like that like you have friends that those guys probably have friends from the jiu-jitsu times right like say hey i'm in town hey come train we'll do some sparring and stuff but the friendship really started back you don't see like a opponent say hey come train with me like let's let's spar together kind of thing. That, that that just don't happen is it, it, it's just jiu-jitsu right you have this and and i and i said that because jiu-jitsu guys deal with losses a lot better than uh than regular fighters because <clears throat> you go into a tournament let's say you do 10 tournaments in a year you're gonna win six seven you do really well and you lose three And, and it's all good. Life keeps moving and, and it bothers because nobody likes to lose, this, to lose. but uh, hey, life moves on, right? And then next week you, you're doing a different tournament and then you win and everything's good again. And and MMA, they just don't have that, I think. I, I think where in, in, a, in a place where you can knock out the other guy and really hurt him, they, they, they don't give too much room for that type of friendship. And, and Jiu-Jitsu, we all think we like i'm i'm putting myself in there but it, it's like i can improve training with that guy and i can improve training with that other guy so let's all train together and we all get better that 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 kind of mentality rolls right yeah yeah plus, plus as well like if i have a grappling match against someone i mean especially in the context of ibjf events like if someone beats me it's unlikely that that'll be the last time we compete against each other. Mm -hmm. And it's, like you said, like I could potentially have a tournament the next weekend, but I think for MMA, it's so personal because like they do a three month camp thinking only about this one guy. Then they go through an excruciating weight cut. Yep. Then they have the fight and then they don't have anything 
else to think about until they book their next match. So exactly. that guy really is polarizing in your life for maybe four mm. to five months. And like if you get injured afterwards and you're suspended, then you're just stuck on the shelf thinking about this one guy. But I mean, for almost a year now, right? Yeah, that's your whole year. I've heard some cool stories though. Like I heard um, Alexander Gustafsson early in his career got beaten by Phil Davis. And then Alexander and Phil started training together straight after. He was like, oh, I need to learn wrestling. He's like, I'm a Scandinavian. We didn't have great wrestling. And those guys linked up and started training. But yeah, very rare. Very Probably rare. takes two real gentlemen to make that, exactly. <laughs> to make that work. I saw, I saw a guy, I don't remember his name now. He got caught uh, on, a, on a crazy submission with uh, Damian Meyer. And he bumped into D Damian Maya after in a in a, in a backstage, and he asked Damian to show him the the the, the submission. Damian had just called him on like 15 minutes before, and uh, then there's some pictures like Damian it's in the middle of this room, like laying on the ground, showing the guy who he just beat the the, the submission. But again, that's rare. That never happens. Like the. the They, they get so sour quick it's it's great but that that's just like you said right like it's the training camp and the mentality is like i want to fucking kill that guy because if i don't want to kill him he he will want to kill me and, and and that's the kind of spirit they get in there too uh and the other thing like you said it's if in jiu-jitsu you fight the same guy like a bunch of times so you, you have your your chance for 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 revenge or or, or like not revenge it's like a, yeah it's a revenge but like a match revenge right not personal but uh gsp said that very interesting because i asked him like he was always so cool and composed and 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 i was like how hard it's to be cool and composed against a guy who already beat you I, I I brought up the the Matt Hughes and Matt Serra uh, rematch. The only two losses he has. Matt Serra, especially, he was in Canada, the first big event in Canada with his entire family watching, like first row. I was like, is d d does that add extra pressure? And, and and that's just what we're talking about. And he was like, oh yes, it does because you already lost to that guy once. You, you lose to him again, you never seen that guy again. Because it's just yeah. it's just not he's gonna be in such a level you're gonna have to get like three four fights before you can even think about fighting that guy again, and that guy might not even be at that same spot anymore. He he might be down, so it, it's gone. So you gotta go with everything you have, and and jujitsu you just don't have that mentality, right? So it's 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 awesome. <clears throat> Do you uh? Do, so w when is the next tournament and, and what are you training for now? I'm uh, I'm training for the rematch against Mason Fowler. But, I, I uh, saw a post. It's like September, right? Like or August. It's, it's... I think, yeah, the last weekend in August. But I'm still trying to convince Chael Sonnen. I'm like, Chael, for the main event, we've got to do more than five minutes. Okay. Five minutes uh, regulation period. It's like not enough time. So right now I'm really trying to convince him i'm like we got to do 10 or 15 minutes because there's sort of like two there's two different ways people play the game like for me and i don't have a problem with it either way because it is a game and people exploit the rules you know but like for me i want to go out there i want to prove i'm better than my opponent ultimately i want to either finish him or dominate him and then if it goes to overtime obviously we have to deal with the overtime but then there's other people like mason sort of played a pretty uh anti jiu-jitsu game And he was hoping to win in the overtime. And I mean that, I mean, it is what it is. Like you can choose to play the game any way you want. Obviously one's going to attract more fans, probably more people are going to want to buy instructionals, go to seminars and stuff. One is winning by any means necessary. So it's like if we can extend it past five minutes, hopefully we can force more, more action in the regulation. Because although we have the jiu-jitsu overtime tournament this weekend with Eddie Bravo's running, I don't think anyone really loves the overtime. They see it as a necessary evil, but no one really loves it. They'd rather see it, the action take place in yeah. the regulation period. Uh, Bushesha, I ask him. I want to talk to you about your fight with uh, Vini Magalhães too, because that was that was that was one of the awkward moments uh, th yeah. that, uh, that, I, that I that that I seen. But Bushesha was pretty. Uh, when when I was talking to him, I was asking about this EBI stuff, submission only, and he doesn't like it. <clears throat> but he doesn't like the other formats either. He, he said, like, when you get to his level, 
uh, people just just try to like stall and they don't take risks just so they can say they had a good match against Bushesha because the, the stocks go up really quick. And he said, and that made me that made almost impossible for me to compete because it's 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 like nobody it's it's, it's doing jujitsu. They just like, kind of just kind of try to have a good match against me, and that means like not letting me do anything or they not trying to do anything. And for the submission only thing, he had these big things like so. I I don't think anyone should start on my back because they didn't deserve to get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I mean I see it. I see it. There's like uh, the pro the the only problem is there's no real solution. You know what I mean? Like if we do golden score first point wins, then again if you are, if you're a wrestler, you're just gonna force an overtime it's, to it, golden it, score. So it's like, and I know what Bushesh is saying. Where people, once you have a name, people they just want to do well. You just you just experienced win. that, right? You ju you were just saying like he he was just trying to be there with you and do well. E even even my previous opponent was a guy called Gabriel Checo. Gabriel is a pretty nice guy and stuff, but he basically did the same thing. But I was able to beat him in overtime, and he he lasted five minutes in regulation. And I remember he put a post up afterwards, being like, "Oh." Everyone doubted me, but I survived five minutes. And I'm like, uh, I mean, I get it. I get yeah. it. You're trying to trying to build the name, but at the same time, it's like that's not the goal here. Like for me, I would honestly rather someone destroy me in regulation. At someone least they're going for it, me. right? Yeah, someone just beats me. Even if they beat me in 20 seconds, I would feel better about that than some sort of strange anti-jiu-jitsu battle that – that ends up going in their favor. Like I would honestly rather get dominated. <laughs> yeah, it sounds strange, but it no, feels it, more it actually real. doesn't because then it's a it's a it's a real fight, right? Like you have your openings, and 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 the guy is really focused on 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 beating you the way it's supposed to happen, not not just. And then like you go to overtime, the guy starts on your back. That's the post. That that's the the Instagram post picture, right? It's like he got yeah. Craig Jones back. It's like, hey guys, hey, uh, my instruction it's out for sale. I'll show you how to get that. <laughs> it's crazy, that's, man. That's true. The other thing with EBI, though, right, is like I, I was thinking as well. I used to believe that EBI was almost a more pure form of the rules because even like I was going to say the referee can't really interfere. Like it's too clear. But obviously that cost me recently. But uh, like <laughs> basically with Bishesh, he doesn't want anyone to start on his back but he still gets to start on that guy's back. And if Bishesh is better from the back, even if Bishesh gets submitted, as long as he submits the guy quicker than he submitted him, he still wins the match. You know? But like the, uh, yeah, the first point and stuff, that, that one's really hard to navigate. Because I mean, if we do first point overtime, you're going to have two guys that are scared to shoot a takedown. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with you when you say there's no real solution for the problem. You just... Yeah. There, there there are uh different formats right i think what uh eddie bravo brought to the table and and metamories and uh and 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 the uh, and and the other events what was the 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 halix uh gracie one the oh halix was uh he was running metamores metamores yeah and then polaris and and and, and yes i'm sorry and then uh eddie I think they brought the excitement back, right? Because nobody can freaking watch like a, a IBJJF gi wards or something. It's 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 crazy. It's just too much technique and 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 it's so technical that it becomes boring. And I love jujitsu, but I, I cannot sit and watch a fucking two hours of a gi match and and everybody's just trying to hold the other guy. It's it's so they, he brought the excitement back. But then you you you, you have kind of a, almost like the same problems, like the guy stalls for five minutes because you know it's gonna have a shot of your back at the end yeah the the, the, the problem is we <laughs> keep looking at jiu-jitsu like we need to find a rule set that makes jiu-jitsu exciting but really like i mean a guy like gary tonin put him in any rule set he's gonna be excited yeah so it's really it's the uh it's the individual athlete's responsibility to make it exciting and really i mean i should say it's both guys responsibility if you put two exciting athletes, two guys that want it in any rule set, it will be exciting. And I think a lot of the guys that play the game a little too much, they don't realize what it costs them. Yes. Because, you, I mean, you could win an ADCC gold medal. That's the pinnacle of the sport. But if you 
if you do it in a boring way, you're not going to you're not going to reap the benefits of your career. You're not going to get the sponsorships, not necessarily get the podcast appearances, sell instructionals and stuff. It's almost better like to be a Gary Tonin yeah. who got a bronze medal at ADCC in some sense. Like if your if your desire is to really grow the sport, if your desire is to grow your bank account, yeah. you know what I mean? Like I, I really believe not all victories are created equal. I mean, it's easy for me to say because I haven't won any major gold medals. I mainly win the super fights, not, not the yet. golds, but – but uh, but that's the that's the way I look at it. Like, if we look at the iconic performances in ADCC history, it's going to be a Marcelo, it's going to be a Hodger, it's going to be a Crone. Yeah. Obviously, those guys that pull off the impossible, that win and win with all submissions. That, that Crone fight against Gary Tonin was one of the craziest fight, right? Oh, <laughs> that, probably the best, probably the best match ever. Yeah. In ADCC yeah, history, yeah, was, I think that was amazing. That was amazing. But listen, you, you are the perfect example for what you're just saying. You just you just said like oh I haven't won any major gold medals or something like that and you are the one the one of the most respected jiu-jitsu guys just because because of your game right it's like doesn't matter if you don't have 10 ADCCs in your back it, you are just relevant as the guy who does because just because of your game and the and the way you play and and what you seek when you're there and that makes all the difference uh I want I want to talk about that uh, Vinny Magalhães fight. How, how, what happened there? Because he was that crazy. You guys stopped kind of fighting, and and there's a chat going on, and you talking to him, he's talking to you, and you both talking to the referee. We all know yeah. the result now, but uh, what happened in that moment? Try to describe it here. Well, I mean, even leading up to the match, I'd seen Gary come very close, Gordon come close, the heel hooks like uh like they got close to. Not finishing it, but they got close to good <clears throat> positions to finish it. So I remember in myself, I was like, maybe he can't be heel hooked. I was really thinking that. But then at the end of the day, no matter how invincible someone seems, like you gotta you gotta believe in the technique. And I was yeah. like, Well, if he can't be heel hooked, I wanna know for myself. If it's <laughs> you know what I mean, I'm gonna put him in the position, test it out. And for Vinny, he has incredibly flexible knees and ankles. So usually when people apply a heel hook Uh, those two aspects of his flexibility save him. But for me, and I don't know, maybe it's because it's later in his career and stuff. Obviously, he's been doing it a long time. But the weakest link in the chain was his uh, shin bone, his fibula. So the first heel hook I put him in, I heard a, I heard a crack, but I didn't know how bad it was. And it cracked. He, he didn't even flinch. He tried to attack my heel. He actually <laughs> caught my heel briefly and twisted it a little bit, but I slipped out. And then the first discussion was I was just like, I, just, I think I was just like, oh, respect. Like I just gave him props for that because we both paused afterwards. And then the second time I got him in the heel hook, when I applied it, there was no resistance. There was no like – and I remember twisting it and seeing his uh, – seeing one of his bones poking through the skin. And I remember – Oh, no. Yeah, I was, I was pulling on it, pulling on it, pulling on it. He's not reacting. Holy and then, shit. then it slipped out. So we stopped. And I, I remember just because I mean I don't really, I don't want to hurt anyone. Even if exactly. I don't. Yeah, I'm not. Like I always want my opponent to have an opportunity to tap. Yeah, you know? that's so what I was gonna say. He, <clears throat> you, you, when you go for a heel hook, you you don't start a hundred percent to try to break the, the 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 fucking guy's feet, right? Like you put the pressure and you give them a chance to say, "Hey, dude, this is going on. Are you gonna tap or not?" And then you put more pressure, right? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> as long as as long as uh, I can isolate their hips. If their hips are isolated, then the submission can be quick or slow. You know what I mean? But like for Vinny, I remember just talking to him after the, that second one. Just I was just like, "Are you okay? Like, are you?" Because like. I knew it was broken and he wasn't reacting in his face. And I remember thinking like, um, like maybe he doesn't know. Like I would want to know if someone broke something of mine and I wasn't paying attention somehow by yeah. some miracle, I didn't feel it. I'd want him to be like, yo, bro, that's pretty bad. So I was giving him a moment to just stop and look at it. And he's, he, he said something like, oh, I think you broke my shin. And I was like, are you, are you sure you want to keep going? And he's like, uh, I was like, are you sure you want to keep going? It's pretty bad. And he's like, yeah, it's already broken. And then we kept going for a That's bit. That's fucking and, crazy. Yeah, just keep and, going. It's already broken. I was looking at his ankle <clears throat> starting to swell up. And eventually he was like, he asked the referee. Because another thing we don't know with Submission Underground, 
we're not allowed to have coaches. So you don't know how long's left in the regulation period. Mm. So when Vinny turned to us to the ref, he's like, how long's left? Because I think I remember thinking, oh, Vinny wants to go to overtime and try and win in overtime. But he actually just wanted to survive regulation so he could continue to say he hasn't been sub- submitted in regulation since I think Hodger Gracie like 15 years ago yeah. or something. So I remember thinking, this guy's crazy. But then the referee called it and Vinny was like, okay, okay. He was like two, three minutes out or something like that. To he, Yeah. He, he, there, there was a lot of time, a lot of time left, right? For, uh, yeah. For overtime. Yeah. I had a, another guy there, was Ethan Kralisin was with me, and he tried to coach illegally. They told him off for it, but I remember he, he yelled something out like, Craig, just stand up. As in, <laughs> that's what I should, I really, I should have done. I should have stood up to see how he could walk on it. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's right. But uh, yeah, in the moment, I was like, uh, it was it was just a confusing moment because I was like, yo, like, if any, then he jokes around on the internet and stuff, and he has his thing. Leg locks don't work. That, I was just like, gonna ask that. Do you think he, he, that that was the? Guy. I I I, re- I really believe that that was a hundred percent of the reason he 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 didn't tamper. He had that legs lock don't work with uh, Gordon, right? Like right after he uh, he won by points and stuff. Like leg locks don't work, and then yeah. he got caught on a on a, on a leg lock, and and he's like, I'm not fucking tapping for this. <laughs> I, th- I think that was it as well. That's like the hesitation. I believe he had just made a rash guard or something to sell online the week before, and leading oh, up to the oh no, and, and leading up to the the match, he was posting some stuff on Twitter and stuff. I like just, <clears throat> I mean, and that's the thing with Vinny. Vinny would joke around and stuff. Like I know he truly doesn't believe it, you know. But like, yeah, he's just. Uh, Vinny's a pretty nice guy in that sense. It's a, it's like, a marketing uh, tool, right? Like, hey, I'm the guy who leg locks don't work kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, I would say me and Vinny go about shit talking a little bit in a similar fashion. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, it's not serious. We're just joking around. But it still does do a good job to to hype up a match. Bad, for sure. For sure. And, and at the end of the match, uh, they ask him something about that. So, well, so it kind of happened, right? You, you You got submission? No, I, I wasn't submitted. I didn't tap. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, all right, whatever yeah. floats your boat. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll let him have it. Eh? But I mean, I guess like, uh, I guess in a grappling event, if I was the referee and I saw a guy's shin break, I'd be like, look, man, like, especially during COVID, the last thing you want to do is send Vinnie Margalesh to hospital no with shit. a leg injury for an event that shouldn't have been happening anyway. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. What I remember, I think that one specifically, it was like a undisclosed location and it was hidden or, or something like that, right? Is this, is this yeah. next one too? No, it's it's kind of like... Well, they're, still, they're still in an undisclosed location, but uh, the previous four were in a southern part of Oregon. It was in a barn that had been repurposed for weddings or something like on a vineyard and the latest one was in a, a tv studio in an undisclosed spot i think i don't know if they're still allowed to do it yet chael sonnen does whatever he wants typically but he did tell me he said yo if the if the governor goes he's like we'll shut it down but he's like and if the governor doesn't contact me we're going ahead yeah kind of that the ufc paid the price for that at that same time right because i remember uh watching uh dunna white in, they they secure a casino in an indian reservation in california remember that that's right yeah, yeah. and and dunna white was like we're not telling people where the ufc is going to be and, and that was this whole thing it's like he, he kind of said as soon as the public finds out where that's going to be they're going to shut it down no matter if it's an Indian reservation, if it's on a fucking sk- sky or whatever, something's going to happen. He had that feeling. He didn't want to let people know. And it was like a week before the fight, they they cut a hold where, where the event was going to happen. And then like a senator from California or a, a congresswoman or something is like, you shouldn't be doing this. And, and then the pressure just built. And they was like, all right. Then ESPN kind of got involved and say, hey, don't do it and and that's when he pulled pulled off and yeah yeah like the the bosses the bosses at the very top told him to stop right but exactly. dana, dana did an interview with chael son and where he kept joking around about the same time he's like how are you getting away with this <laughs> because nobody knows where is that <laughs> yeah <laughs> that makes yeah, yeah. that makes a hundred percent of the the sense look let's uh you, you're going to train today right sunday it's yep. probably like 150 degrees out 
Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you go so I, so we don't we don't delay your training. Let's stay in touch. As soon as uh, something gets scheduled, maybe if like maybe a little bit before your your fight, we'll get together again. We'll do like a like a breakdown or something like that. That would be awesome to happen. Oh, for sure, awesome. Thank you very much for having me on. Hey, I appreciate Craig, man. Thanks so much, man. Happy Sunday. Train hard and uh, thanks for doing this. I appreciate. It. Thanks, bro. See ya. Appreciate, it, brother.